Hello and welcome to the first case study example on UK Analytics. In this case study example, we are going to talk about business forecasting. Business forecasting is one of the important topics in data science and analytics and it will continue to be so. And the reason for this is human fascination and desire to learn about future. Time series modeling is one of the scientific ways to learn about future or forecast the future. We're going to learn a lot about time series modeling in this case study example. So let's move on to the case study example. I've set three objectives or goals for this video series. The first is to give you a glimpse of doing data science in the real business environment. Personally speaking, mine is a close to a decade and a half long journey in the field of data science, analytics and number crunching. And I would like to communicate the joy that I have felt while being in the field to all of you and how it's been a fascinating journey, how it's a great field to be in. And the most important thing that I would like to achieve through these uh, video lectures is to communicate the whole aspect of thinking creatively and differently in the field of data science. So there's a lot of talk about like Python, R and different uh, programming languages, big data. So I feel they are all important. They are important aspects of data science. But the most important aspect, according to me, is creative thinking and thinking differently, thinking about a problem in a new way. And that is something that I would like to communicate uh, throughout these uh, lecture series that you'll see on UK Analytics. So before we move on to the case study, let's try to understand the importance of time related data or temporal data in the age of big data. So there's a lot of talk about big data these days, like data size of data is growing. Let's try to understand why big data is big. So I'll tell you, big data is not big because we are collecting a lot of variables or parameters. That's not the reason why big data is big. It's not that we are collecting some billions and zillions of variables. Big data is big because we are collecting a few or sometimes more than a few variables over a period of time. So let me try to explain it with an example. We know of our own heartbeat. So heartbeat is one variable or parameter. And if we will capture our heartbeats throughout our lifetime. Now one heartbeat is just a pulse and if you measure and capture this data throughout your lifetime, you're essentially capturing big data. Now the second question is why are we collecting so much data? One of the ways to look at it is if you just observe these pulses or heartbeats over a period of time, you'll notice that there is a pattern to it. They are recurring with the same shape with the same frequency. Now this knowledge can be used to actually compress the size of data. You don't need to store the entire big data. You can just reduce it to few pulses and you say this is a recurring pattern and I'm going to just instead of capturing some few terabytes of data, I could just store it in few kilobytes. Another thing that you could do is you could use this information to forecast or to predict what is going to happen in future. Now, In this case, you know that like the same pattern will keep repeating itself and you know after 10 minutes what kind of pattern to expect. It's going to be the same pattern. Now the same concept of forecasting and predicting future, let's take it to the next level. In this case, we'll try to forecast a time series or a pattern, but it's no longer a recurring pattern as we have seen previously. So as you could see, here we have a pattern which is a, not a repetitive pattern. So it almost looks random. And if I'll ask you what is going to happen, so this is the time scale that we have got, and this is one parameter, how it is going up and down. So if I'll ask you what is going to happen to this parameter after say, 10 minutes. I'm sure because of this random pattern, you can't make out what is going to happen after say 10 minutes. And to be honest, this pattern is not random. And this is what we are going to discover in this particular video, that the pattern that you are seeing on your screen is not random, that there is an underlying order to this pattern. And the discovery of this underlying order is what time series modeling and time series analysis is all about. And this is what we are going to discover in this video lecture. And just to complete the train of thought and also to ex explain the importance of temporal or time related data, let's have a look at different sources from which we get time related data. And if you look at it, 
temporal data is being generated from so many different sources and over a period of time we are just going to sit on a mass of temporal data or time related data and this is going to create massive requirement to analyze this data make sense of this data to, to derive meaning out of this data to be honest this is going to be one of the biggest problem in data science as we will go further it already is there are several ways in which data scientists try to solve this problem however i must tell you it is still an open problem there is still people are still trying to find efficient and effective ways to make sense out of temporal data and use it for forecasting and predictions so if you are an aspiring data scientist this is a problem for you so here we are in the first video case study example on you can analytics as discussed in this case study example we are going to talk about business forecasting and to be particular we are going to estimate the future tractor sales for a company so this is a manufacturing company they produce uh, tractors and we'll estimate how many tractors will sell in the next quarter and quarter after that in the next year and so on and so forth by doing so we are going to help the company in its supply chain management we'll help them in terms of uh, planning their inventory better and moreover we are going to use time series modeling as we have already discussed if you ever want to learn how humans come together and work for a cause i suggest you go to a manufacturing plant in my career as a data scientist i got this opportunity a few times and to be honest that's the fun part of being a data scientist that you get to work with and see so many different industries when you go to a manufacturing plant like the one shown over here a tractor manufacturing plant you'll see that to make that one equipment so many different industries they come together so many different human they come together to make a tractor you need rubber you need plastic you need steel iron electricity petroleum and so many different acts of human endeavor they come together to make that one piece of equipment that you use and in order for a manufacturing plant to run properly it's essential for them to manage their inventory well now this is the reason why this tractor manufacturing company has hired you as a data scientist to manage their inventory now if you could see inventory is not a function of their current sales or the historic sales but it's a function of their future sales and this future could be few minutes ahead or could be few months few years what this company wants you to do for them is to forecast their sales so that they can manage their inventory better and what you are going to do is you are going to build a time series model to forecast their sales this company also wants to learn the impact of marketing on their tractor sales so a few years ago this company has uh, started a new marketing department with a lot of vigor and they want to understand whether there's an impact of this marketing effort and campaigns on tractor sales now this on surface this may seem like a simple correlation problem however as you'll realize later that for a time series problem the simple correlation doesn't work so after defining goals for your analysis and also defining business benefits from it you straight away went to the IT head of the company there you ask for the relevant data for your analysis you know that it will take them some time to fetch this data and waiting for data is usually the most impatient period for a data scientist this is the reason you have decided to use this period to think about time series modeling and time series analysis in a different way so while you are waiting for your data let me help you think about time series in a different way and for this i'm going to talk about physics i'm a trained physicist i Uh, some 20 years ago i started my career as a physicist i did my masters in physics and then i went to, went on to do my phd in physics so i am going to talk about physics and how it is useful for time series modeling then i am also going to talk about randomness so we saw this uh, pattern earlier in this lecture video and my point is that this pattern that you are seeing on your screen is not random and we'll discover it how this is not random as we'll move further moreover I'm also going to talk about my own career. So how I made my career transition from physicist or from being a physicist to being a data scientist. It's been an exciting journey and just to add I never finished my PhD. I dropped out from my PhD program to pursue my career in data science. Just to add the three words that you are seeing on your screen is the time series of my professional life. Physics to randomness to career in data science. Let me talk a bit about it. So as I was telling you I'm a trained physicist and I love physics I still do even though I have chosen data science as a profession I still sneak out and read physics 
I go and read books on quantum mechanics, string theory, big bang, chaos theory or whatever I can get hold of. I think this quote by Isaac Rabi captures the essence of being a physicist. And to me, curiosity is the essence of being a data scientist as well. Physics is a study of forces of nature. So let's try to understand physics through this picture. The picture that you're seeing on your screen is of a baseball game. So what you're seeing on your screen is a pitcher who has just thrown a ball. And at the same time, there's this ball dangling over here. Now your brain, which understands some of these forces of nature, has figured out what is the direction of this ball. So at this point of time, the ball is over here. And if I'll ask you in next nanosecond where the ball is going to be, your brain can give a very good answer that it's going to be somewhere here. And it will continue to move in the same direction till it will experience yet another force. Study of this movement under the influence of different forces of nature is what physics is all about. So let's look at different forces that the ball is experiencing. So if this is our ball, then the first force that the ball is experiencing is momentum. It's not a force, but it's because of the force that the pitcher has exerted on the ball. And that same momentum is what is taking the ball forward. The second force that the ball is experiencing is the force of gravity, which is pulling it downwards. And the third force that the ball is experiencing is air resistance, which is kind of slowing the ball down. Now what we are seeing is a picture of Newtonian mechanics or a classical physics where things are deterministic. And when I say deterministic, what it means is that if you are aware of all the forces that the body is experiencing, you can predict or forecast its position in time. And that is exactly what we did when we looked at the baseball. And if you think of it, sales is kind of similar. So a company's sale is a function of different forces that it is experiencing. And this is an analogy, don't take it too literally, but forces such as uh, supply, demand, and economy. So many different forces are acting on sales for it to move in a certain direction. And that is the reason how physics could be useful also in terms of prediction of sales or forecasting sales. So the next thing that I want to talk about is my journey from physics to data science, how I made this transition. To tell you more about it, when I started my PhD, after a few months of starting my PhD, I realized that sitting in a lab is not my thing. I was not enjoying the thought of just being in the lab and not interacting with people. And research can be extremely lonely. And I realized that's not part of my personality. So I came to a crossroad where I was thinking about whether I wanted to continue with the research or not. So at this crossroads, I started to think about the whole purpose of career and what one wants to do with their career, what is the right choice of career. And I talked to several people about it. I did some of some introspection myself. And this is the gist of this entire exercise. So what I noticed is that life is on a time scale. It's a linear time, which keeps moving ahead. And if we plot it on two axes, now this is <laughs> some physicists talking for sure. So if you look at life, it keeps going through this ups and downs like a sine wave. This is true for your happiness. This is true for... So sometime you are up and sometime you are down. Look at it. This up and down, up and down cycle is inevitable in life. You're going to go through this up and down. And choice of career, what I believe, is a way for you to not just deal with the ups of life, but also downs. And that's when I kind of make this made this list of keywords which I believe will be helpful for me to have a fulfilling career. And these are problem solving, working with smart people, creativity, mathematics, scientific investigation, learning and knowledge sharing, delivering quantifiable benefits. So once I wrote it down and I started kind of stumbling around, around different careers, it just so happened that I ended up in data science. And in last decade and a half, I must say I've, I'm able to check mark all these keywords in my as a choice for, for my career 
And I must also say that it's not that I don't go through these ups and downs anymore in my profession, but my choice of career, that is data science, helped me deal with it much better. So the predictable up and down sign function of life that we have seen in the previous slide, if it interacts with other sine waves or other predictable sine waves, it can produce patterns that are as close to randomness. So if you see over here, let's say A is the sine wave of your life, B is your family, C is your colleagues, friends, and so on and so forth. So there's a product of these four predictable sine waves can form a pattern which can look almost like randomness. And it is very difficult to predict this pattern that you're seeing over here, which almost looks like a random pattern, and which is a, just a product of A, B, C, and D. So you can't predict this. However, if you can just extract these four sine waves out of this random pattern, you can easily predict it. And that is the idea behind something that uh, you must have heard in your college Fourier series. And this idea is what is used very effectively in time series modeling and time series forecasting. So let me explain how this idea is used in time series modeling. So when you think of time series modeling, what you see is this top pattern. If you are trying to say forecast sales, what you see is the actual series which is on the top and it looks like a jagged series it goes up and down it's very hard to predict anything out of this original series so what you do is you try to extract certain meaningful patterns within this series what you do is you divide it into trends seasonality cycles and once you extract those meaningful patterns you want the remainder to look like a random pattern and this idea is very similar to what we have noticed in the previous slide where the combination of several sine waves was producing the function of life which is going up and down and that's the observed function so what you observe is the actual series and then you try to extract the other meaningful components out of it so now that we have come to the end of this video it's possible that i have given you several ideas around time series modeling and some of them may even seem patchy and uncorrelated the reason for that is that I'm still getting used to this video format. And what I suggest is that you go to my blog and you can actually find this entire case study on my blog. And you will find ways to connect these ideas in that case study. So it's all explained over there. If you go to this uh, manufacturing case study that I'm showing over here. And once you go to this manufacturing case study and click, or click on this link, You'll find all these ideas available in this particular case study, which is a time series modeling case study. And some of the ideas that I discuss in this video are from this part one of the case study. If you go further down, you'll find most of these things that we discussed. And you can actually find all the codes or the way to build or a step-by-step -step guide to build forecasting model in this particular part of the case study where you'll find all the codes and how the analysis is done. So if you're interested in more hands-on guide, this is available in this part of the series, which is, I think it's part four. and. So hope you'll enjoy the case study.